So my goal here is to give uh, sort of a very accessible description of myotonic dystrophy type 2 uh, to a lay audience, not a, not a sophisticated scientist. Um, so uh, in that goal, I'm going to describe sort of the, the, the genetics of the disease, how the disease is inherited, um, and then we're going to go on to, you know, the mechanism of how that disease is caused and then utilize that molecular mechanisms to describe how you know, several groups, including my own, are using it to try and de design potential drugs that can treat the disorder. And so I want to stress potential, but there is you know, hope for the, for the future and hopefully not too distant future in uh, making therapeutics for myotonic dystrophy type 2. And then I'm going to end the talk sort of making parallels between uh, DM2 and myotonic dystrophies in general with uh, many other neuromuscular disorders and sort of um, articulate some unifying principles that uh, drug companies could use, for example, to try, to try to make lead therapeutics not just against myotonic dystrophy type 1 and type 2, but also against a host of other disorders with sort of a rising tide raises all ships mentality. And so um, first I want to, I in this slide, give you a description about uh, the myotonic dystrophies. So uh, there's two types. They're inherited diseases that are the most common causes of adult onset muscular dystrophy. Uh, they affect about 1 in 8,000 people worldwide. There are certain genetic populations, such as people of German descent or French Canadians, that may have a higher incidence of the disease. <clears throat> Type 1 is the most common form of myotonic dystrophy. The disease is typically characterized uh, by muscle wa wasting and weakness, and symptoms develop when a person's in their 20s or 30s, although that, that can vary. It could be earlier or later, and as we'll describe uh, in the middle of this talk, the, the onset of the disease uh, symptoms uh, can be related to the length of uh, toxic RNA. So if we can go to the, uh, and one, one last thing. So in the slides, I've made a point to put references below them which can give you, uh, if you want more information or perhaps more, more sophisticated information or just more information in general about a particular topic, you can just copy these HTTP links into your web browser and find the sources where I got most of the information. So I tried to make a, a focus on doing that so things would be understandable if you didn't uh, catch everything. Okay, so if we, okay, so um, diagnose. Diagnosis and disease mechanisms. So the initial diagnosis can be made via physical exam to identify a pattern of muscle wasting and weakness. And uh, EMG can be performed to measure the electrical activity of muscles because myotonic dystrophy, obviously it's a uh, neuromuscular disorder. There are defects associated with, uh, with muscles. Um, and this is going to come back later in the talk. So a definitive diagnosis for myotonic dystrophy is a genetic test. And that genetic test is done in which a patient has blood sample drawn and gene alterations are measured. And so what I mean by gene alterations is they'll actually sequence segments of your genome to see, for example, if you have gene alterations in uh, two genes, a DMPK gene, dystrophia myotonia protein kinase, I'll refer to it as DMPK, or a CNBP gene, which is a cellular and nucleic acid binding protein. Uh, mutate gene alterations in CNBP are the causes of myotonic dystrophy type 2, where gene alterations in DMPK are the causes of myotonic dystrophy type 1. If we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so uh, myotonic dystrophies, and especially myotonic dystrophy type 2, it's something called an autosomal dominant disorder. And so if, for example, you had a father, or your father had myotonic dystrophy, whereas your mother did not. She was unaffected with disease, and they had children, uh, four children. Uh, to get the disease, all you would need would be to inherit one copy of the, the gene that causes the disease, and you would be affected. So that's called autosomal dominant, and it's shown if you have four children on the bottom. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. Can we get a... Okay. Um, so... When someone goes to sequence your genome to diagnose if you have DM2, what they do is they, they look at a particular location or locus in your, your genetic code, right, your DNA. And so if you have DM2, uh, 
what they look for is the gene sequence in the CNBP DNA. And if you have DM2, you have this repeat of CCTG that ranges in length from 75 to as much as 100 or 10,000 or more. And so that difference, that extra long piece of CCTG is what causes DM2. And what you can see is if you're healthy, you have a repeat of CCTG of about, that can range from 11 to 26. So that's giving us some insight into perhaps, or some hints into what the molecular basis for the disorder is. And then as I'll go on later, how potentially we can treat it. And so if you can go to the next slide. And so um, before I go into disease mechanism, it's going to be critical for me to sort of build a foundation with you guys about um, how genes are made into RNA. And in the case for myotonic dystrophy type 1 and type 2, disease um, can be caused by synthesis of a toxic RNA. Um, now the causes of that, of the disease, is that there winds up being defects in RNA processing. So if you look at this slide, and just as a quick aside, on the bottom of it, uh, I have an overview from the Nobel Prize website of DNA, genes, RNA, and protein. And so if you want more information about uh, how DNA gets made into RNA, RNA gets processed and made into protein, you can simply click that link, and there's various uh, degrees of difficulty or advanced uh, knowledge base that you have to describe what's going on. And so in the top of the slide, we can see in a cell's nucleus, uh, we have DNA. Right? And so DNA, what happens is it gets made, and it's on chromosomes, it can get replicated by DNA, DNA polymerase to make two copies of the DNA. Uh, when DNA gets replicated, that's how, how um, basically genetic defects can be passed on to children. Um, however, DNA in a patient uh, or any human is made into RNA via a process called RNA transcription. So the DNA just serves as a copying template um, just like the printing, a printing press would go and print dollar bills, right? DNA is the, the, the metal, um, is basically what you're trying to copy, and then you spot that on the paper where you can make RNA. Um, RNA, it gets processed, and I'll describe at a low level uh, what RNA processing is and how we're going to focus that on myotonic dystrophy. Uh, but RNA gets processed, and then that RNA goes outside of the cell's nucleus into a cytoplasm, where it gets translated into protein. Um, okay, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so, so it's important to understand DNA goes to RNA goes to protein, and so I tried to figure out an easy analogy for this. And so what I'm gonna uh, think about in that last slide was this RNA processing. So DNA gets made into RNA, RNA gets processed, and then that RNA gets translated into protein. So how does RNA get processed? Well, RNA gets processed in the same way uh, where if you have a, ch a child, your child gets these toys where uh, they have basically a frame with these plastic pieces in it. And then you basically have to read some instructions and you can take those pieces and instruction number one can say, okay, if we put these pieces in a certain order, uh, we can make, for example, a solar helicopter. But those same pieces, if we assemble it into a different order, can make a solar car. And so when we go to process RNA, those pieces, right, those, those big thick pieces get made into either the helicopter or the car, whereas the framing, the framework becomes junk, right? It's not stuff that we generally keep around, and it's certainly not raw materials that get made into this helicopter or car. And so the framing is going to be introns, so it's pieces of RNA that generally does not get made into proteins, whereas these pieces that are in the framing we're going to call exons. So they're pieces of RNA that actually get assembled into something active, and the analogy is that assembly makes protein. So if you can go to the next, next slide. And so here's just reiterating what I just said. So when RNAs are made from DNA, Right? They're made with these, these colored rectangles are basically these pieces of the toy that actually gets assembled into a toy. And in between those pieces, we have these white lines. That's the frame. And so if you have instructions, you can basically stick um, a gray rectangle next to a red rectangle next to a 
light blue rectangle and that'll give you your helicopter. Or you can put the gray rectangle next to the green rectangle next to the blue rectangle and for example that can give you a solar car but in both case, cases that white line in the pre-mRNA or the intron is removed. And so it's very critical in cells to control how you assemble mature messenger RNAs or these toys from their parts. That has to be very tightly controlled. And that mechanism is one mechanism that is short-circuited in myotonic dystrophy type 2. You can go to the next slide. And so um, here's just reiterating this. And so how, how does a cell decide what pieces of a messenger RNA are parts that get assembled into a toy or a protein versus parts that are framed. And so the way it does that is it recruits proteins that wind up binding to the messenger RNA and basically serve as instructions to determine how one assembles a mature messenger RNA from its parts. And so when you assemble that mature messenger RNA, this, these two um, spheres these green spheres are the ribosome, and what they do is they read out this mature messenger RNA to make protein. And some of the proteins that they can make, for example, are ion channels in muscle, which are dysregulated in myotonic dystrophy and help to explain some of the muscle, the muscle abnormalities. And so if we can go to the, the next slide. And so what, is, what does all of this have to do with this um, repeat of CCTG that's in the CNBP uh, gene locus. Well, what happens is this uh, CCTG RNA, which is actually an intron, so it's actually the piece of the framework that we went to assemble the toys. It's, it's originally thought that these pieces of, of DNA, when they're made into RNA, are not functioning. They're actually junk. Well, it turns out in myotonic dystrophy, those RNAs not only have a function, but they have a function that stimulates a disease. And so what happens is uh, the CCTG DNA gets transcribed or copied into RNA via transcription, and it forms this RNA structure that's shown in the white letters. So it's CCUG repeat. So in RNA, T is replaced with U, and then when this, this RNA is made, it actually folds up into this structure that I show here, which looks very similar to a hairpin. And so we call that the DM2 RNA hairpin. And that RNA is actually the toxic entity that contributes to disease in myotonic dystrophy type 2. So if we can go to the, the next slide. And so the way in which this toxic RNA hairpin contributes to disease is what that RNA does is it's, it's very long. Remember, it, has, it can have a repeat length of tens of thousands. It, it is basically very long, and that RNA winds up binding to and sequestering proteins. So remember those proteins that we talked about to be instructions on how to assemble messenger RNAs. Well, what this toxic RNA does is it's basically superglue, and what it glues to itself are these protein instructions to figure out how to assemble messenger RNAs from these tinker toy pieces. And so this sequestration of the protein by the RNA is what causes myotonic dystrophy type 2. So if we can go to the next slide. And so the way I'm just schematically here showing what I just told you on the last slide. And so if we have a messenger, a pre-messenger RNA, right, which has this gray building block, the green, or I guess yellow green building block, red building block, and this blue building block separated by this framework, well, your cell doesn't know how to assemble these building blocks together because the protein that normally sits on them to figure out is basically serves as the instructions to tell, tell, tell a cell how to put together these pieces are not there. So you basically don't have any instructions and you have these parts, these toy parts you have to assemble. And so what happens in DM2 is you can get fully functioning toy parts in some cases but in others, you don't get fully functioning toy parts. And when you don't get that fully functioning part, you don't get a proper expression of proteins such as these chloride ion channels that are sitting on muscle. And so this mechanism is what caused disease because a cell doesn't have enough instructions to figure out how to assemble 
uh, certain RNAs that are going to properly encode for proteins. So if we can go to the next slide. And so how, how have people viewed this mechanism as a way uh, to develop therapeutics? So really what you want to do is, um, as I show in the top, say, half of this slide, that RNA is bound to and sequestering these protein instructions. And so if you want to make a therapeutic, what, what you want to do, or a drug, you want to basically make a drug that binds to the RNA and freeze this protein. And if you can free that protein, then it's not stuck to the DM2 RNA, and it can get bound to other, it can basically serve as instructions to figure out how to piece together uh, messenger RNAs to make fully functioning proteins. So if we can go to the next slide. And so how, so I want to sort of give you uh, a talk about how my group is figuring out how to make compounds or make drugs that bind to these RNAs. And so the analogy that I'm going to use is basically a lock and a key, right? And so you know that, or you hope, right, that the key to your front door is only unique to your front door in the whole neighborhood. And you can test that by basically taking the key to your house and going and try to opening up all the door, all the front doors of your neighbor's homes. And so what my group and I do in sort of trying to figure out how to basically get a key that gets into a lock or a drug, right, which is the key, which binds to this DM2 repeating RNA, which is the lock, is we basically take our drug and test it for binding to thousands of RNAs simultaneously with a goal of figuring out which drug, which, which drug binds to the DM2 structure with very, very high affinity and selectivity. That is, the only RNA that this drug will bind to is an RNA that's present in, D, is an RNA motif or fold that's present in DM2 RNA. And the analogy is, again, that you only want the key to unlock your door. You don't want it to unlock your neighbors. You want it to be highly selective for this, this DM2 repeat. And so if we can go to the next slide. And so what we've done is we found that the right combination for getting a drug that binds to the DM2 motif is this um, violet colored sphere. So it turns out that compound binds to DM2 motif with very high affinity and selectivity. And so you can see what it binds to uh, is one copy of this, uh, one copy of the RNA motif that's present in the RNA that causes DM2. And you can see there's many copies of this motif that are stitched next to each other. And so if you can go to the next slide. And so what the group's goal ultimately, or what, what my research goal is, is to try to figure out ways in which we can get extremely highly selective compounds binding to DM2 RNAs and other RNAs. And so it doesn't, I think, take too much uh, imagination to see that when we have the violet compound binds to one copy of this RNA fold in DM2, that one way to get the compound to bind tighter and to be more selective for that repeat is to just simply, um, instead of having one compound bind one motif, it's to make a compound with two copies of the binder oriented in such a way that it binds to two of these motifs simultaneously. And so our group, uh, we basically use compounds that bind multiple sites to map out the structure of CCUG, which is this repeating structure, not just one copy of this RNA motif. And so the analogy for this, back to this lock and key analogy, is it's basically, say you have one key that binds to one lock on your door. Well, that may not be enough, right? People have deadbolts on their front door to make things more secure. So this is the equivalent of having two keys to open up the front door or to bind the DM2 motif with selective, with high, that are highly selective, where one can unlock the lock and one can unlock, or one can open the doorknob and one can unlock the deadbolt. And so the advantage of that is you get very high affinity and very selective compounds. So here's an example of that. So as I mentioned earlier, DM2 is caused because that long repeating RNA, what it does is it binds to and sequesters 
proteins. And so what we want to do is figure out how good these compounds that we've designed are at binding to the RNA and freeing the protein. Okay, and so what this plot is, is basically the amount of a drug that inhibits half of the protein from binding to that DM2 RNA. And so what you can see is our monomeric compound, which is to the far right, it's just one copy of this RNA binder, has a potency that's shown up to the far left, sorry, with, as a potency that's shown to the far left. However, if we have two copies of this RNA binder separated by the appropriate distance, that compound turns out to be a thousand times better at binding to and inhibiting 50% of the protein bound to the DM2 RNA. And then if we get in even better, so instead of using two copies of this motif, we make uh, two copies of this compound that binds the DM2 motif, we stitch three copies together, then that compound becomes 100,000 times better than that single compound, right? So that, then that's one copy of that uh, violet colored sphere. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. And so the analogy of this, so, so remember we started with a compound, a single compound, then we went to a dimer, two copies of the compound, then we went to something that has three copies on it. Well, if we were to think about an analogy in going from one to a hundred times better to 10,000 times better and reverse that and think about a drug, a drug dose or how much um, of water or Coke we wanted to drink. Um, so the monomer had a potency to inhibit 50% of that protein loading of basically all of the water in a hot tub. The dimer, in order to get inhibit 50% of protein loading, is a two liter bottle of Coke. And the trimer required only a teaspoon of the compound to inhibit 50% of loading. And so we can see the scale or the, the effectiveness of the compound is increasing dramatically. And that in principle should result in a diminishment in the amount of compound that's required to repair a defect, the DM2 defect. If you can go to the next slide. And so, so now I'm going to talk to you about binding of our compounds. And so I didn't mention it earlier, but the protein that winds up sticking onto the DM2 RNA repeat is a protein called muscle blind like one protein that I'm abbreviating here as MBNL1. And so if we want to if we want to inhibit the binding of muscle blind to DM2 RNA with a drug then it would be advantageous to have the drug be a better binder to the DM2 RNA than the protein is. So we'd like it to, to be a tighter binder, we'd like it to bind with, with higher affinity, and we'd also like it to be more selective. That is, uh, the drug is going to hit just the genetic defect and not touch any, any others. And so what's shown here in the black bars is tells us the selectivity of our design drug, which we, we're going to abbreviate as 3K4. And so what you can see that drug likes DM2 RNA several hundred times more than it likes any of these other, other RNAs. So in fact, this one that's in the one over from the far left, it likes, two, it likes DM2 RNA 250 times better than it likes um, these other mutated RNAs. So the compound's highly selective. And what you can see in red bars is how much does muscle blind like DM2 RNA over all these other targets. And what you can see, the take home message is that we can design compounds rationally and all that I'm describing to you is, is things that we, we rationally design that are much better at recognizing uh, C, these DM2 RNA hairpins than the protein that's stuck to it is. And so that, that's a big benefit. Um, and we hope it stimulates people to, um, to get active in the area. Okay, Sorry so. about that. That's all right. Can we go to the next slide? I think that and then the other thing that's important is if you want to inhibit the binding of that protein to CCUG repeating RNA or DM2 RNA, you want it to be a higher affinity binder. And so the way to think about that is if you can bind a drug 
an RNA better than the natural protein, then you would, again, require much less of it um, to be an effective drug. And you really want to try to get compounds that you require a lot less of them to be therapeutics because there could be potentially less side effects. And so in our case, our designed compound, 3K4, it binds to uh, the DM2 RNA with greater than 15-fold higher affinity than this toxic protein, than, than the protein does to cause DM2. If you can go to the next slide. And so what does 15-fold higher affinity mean, right? So 15 times higher affinity. And so my analogy for this is sort of ten material strength or tensile strength tensile strength of materials. And so what are two materials that are different in strength by 15-fold? And so the analogy could be the binding of protein to DM2 repeats is the strength of a ceramic pot. So everybody has them in their house and you drop them and you, they shatter pretty easily. Well, something that's 15, 15 times stronger than that ceramic pot is steel. And so the analogy is that the compounds are binding, uh, forming a 15-fold stronger interaction, which is the difference at a very rough approximation between a ceramic, a porous ceramic pot and some steel. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. Okay, so now how effective are these compounds at improving DM2 defects? So what I'm showing here is a plot of Basically, if we have a, a model DM2 cell, what is the effect of the compound on, um, on the DM2 defect? And so to the far left in this slide that I have this bar that says non-DM2, well, these are cells that do not express the DM2 defect. And they basically give you a protein expression level that's shown at the top of this bar. However, if you go to the bar that's just next to it, which has DM2 above it, that's the amount of protein that it gives in DM2. So the difference between these, the far left bar and the bar next to it is the difference between a healthy cell and a DM2 affected cell. And so what I'm showing to the right of those two bars is what if we have a DM2 affected cell, but we add our drugs. And so what you can see is when you add the drugs to these cells, we basically get a protein content that, although the cell expresses the CCUG repeat in it, we get protein uh, spli or messenger RNA splicing activity in a cell, so the ability to assemble these parts together. Uh, even though it has the genetic defect, the assembly of those parts looks much more like, in fact, all the way like cells that don't even express at all that DM2 repeat. So in some sense, these molecules at this very basic cellular experiment are capable of, capable of improving quite dramatically these DM2 associated defects. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, and so um, one thing that my group is interested in is sort of RNA structural biology. And so uh, what we did is we wanted to, to understand how our drugs bound to the RNA but also figure out how the toxic RNA looks. And so what we did is we, in A, we made this RNA that looks like this. And so what this RNA does in um, orange is it has three copies of this DM2 motif, or it has a mimic of this CCUG repeat. And so what we were able to do by playing some tricks that we learned from Andy Berglund's lab at uh, University of Oregon is that we could figure out ways to coax these RNAs to grow into a crystalline shape or crystalline form, just like you know you have uh, salt, uh, you're, you have salt crystals that you put on your food. Well, if we want to figure out the structure of an RNA, we need to get things to be crystalline. That is, your salt crystals or sodium chloride that you put to salt your food, they have a very ordered uh, geometry in the crystal. And based on that order, what you can do is you can uh, basically shoot X-rays at it and map out where atoms are and figure out what the exact structure of the DM2 RNA is. And so if we, and so let's, let's focus in, for example, on uh, these. So look at L1, L2, and L3. So let's look at L2. So you see there's a CUCU step where it doesn't look like there's, there's no bars between 
uh, the C and U's that are on other 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 uh, that are opposite each other in this RNA construct. So can you go to and so in B, B here in this slide. What if can you go back? Sorry. B in this slide here. What's highlighted with the red background is the structure of this DM2 RNA. So if you go to the next slide. What the next slide shows you is how these C across from U interactions look. And so this was the, the first structure of the DM2 RNA. So it really told us you know, how this RNA folds in an orientation that we could generate ideas on how protein could bind to it and sort of use that as a basis to try to find ways to make better compounds that can target the repeat. But it also allowed us to figure out how our drug bind bound to the repeat. So if you can go to the next slide. And so the next slide is basically a structure of our compound. We call this a dimeric compound. So it has two of these uh, purple or violet RNA binding modules bound to this DM2 repeat. And so what you can see is in A is that it turns out there's a lot of interactions with our drugs in these loops. Um, and it sort of helps to under, tell us or teach us lessons about how we can get compounds that bind to these RNAs with extremely high affinity and selectivity because ultimately that's what we, we have to do if we want to make a therapeutic for DM2 because the compound has to be specific only for the genetic defects so we can minimize uh, long-term side effects. Can you go to the, the next slide, please? Okay, so, so where are we in the drug development process? process. And so, um, you know, making drugs is a long and arduous pro uh, process. And so where we are here is we have the first compounds that are capable of reversing DM2 associated defects in cells. So we're about where this white bar is uh, in the drug discovery pipeline. And so we have a ways to go if our ultimate goal is to get a compound, and it is, right, uh, that's FDA approved. But I think there's other advantages in this area that may accelerate uh, the ability to get drugs to patients. So if you can go to the next slide. And so some of those advantages I'm going to articulate in the end of this talk. So we're about close to winding up. And so I told you a story um, about DM2 RNA, which is the second to the left RNA of these four, and it's just four examples of many, where basically an RNA was uh, made from a gene and that RNA folded up to be toxic, where it could bind to proteins and cause disease. Well, it turns out that mechanism is not uh, unique to DM2. It turns out DM1, myotonic dystrophy type 1, also uh, expresses an expanded RNA repeat of CUG that folds up into this hairpin structure that's shown to the left. It also turns out that these CGG repeats, which is the, the third um, RNA structure, well that RNA also folds up into this um, repeating structure, this repeating hairpin structure, and that causes fragile X associated tremor ataxia syndrome. And then this RNA to the far right is a toxic RNA that's been relatively recently uncovered uh, that we think might fold into a structure that looks like this, although there's other potential structures that it could fold into. Uh, and this RNA causes ALS and frontal temporal dementia. In fact, it causes about 40% of the cases of ALS. And that RNA, too, folds up into this repeating structure that binds to and sequesters proteins. And so our lab is centrally focused on using the lessons that we've learned in the myotonic dystrophy type 2 and type 1 areas to try to drug all of these targets. But not only that, because there's greater than 20 diseases that may be due to what's called a toxic RNA that binds to a protein, is that people can think about general approaches to study and tackle this issue and impact all of the diseases. And so that's why the title of this slide is A Rising Tide Raises All Ships. Because um, pharmaceutical companies, unfortunately, they view many of these diseases as how many customers you have. If there's an orphan disorder, uh, there may not be as many customers. And so if they, if they, if there's the lessons that they learned by drugging, drugging DM2, they can apply to other targets, then it makes it more exciting, more Im impactful in a broad sense for them to get interested in these therapeutic areas.
And so really the lessons that we learned from DM1 and DM2 are going to be directly applicable to all of these diseases and generally help all of the patients that are afflicted with these class of disorders. If you can go to the next slide. And so one way in which people are drugging these RNAs are to use things called antisense oligonucleotides. And so um, if, if you're interested in this area, and so this is work in generally myotonic dystrophy type 1, it's the work of Charles Thornton, Tom Cooper, and Wansick, where they've used basically antisense oligonucleotides to bind to a toxic protein. And so, if you're, and so people are using antisense oligonucleotides to advance therapy for DM1, but certainly the lessons that they learn by using these antisense oligonucleotides are going to advance other areas. I don't have time to go into what an antisense oligonucleotide, how it works, but I can tell you that there are webinars on the MDF website by both Bruce Wentworth and Charles Thornton that go into more details of the mechanism of these therapeutic approaches and certainly articulate how, again, a rising tidal raise all ships and these lessons can be used to tackle other uh, related diseases. So if you can go to the next slide. Here's, here's another interesting thing is that all these diseases that we've mentioned, myotonic dystrophy type 2, type 1, they're all orphan diseases. And so although I mentioned that, you know, activity in the pharmaceutical companies, um, it, it's actually, it's increasing in this area. So it's an exciting time. And I think there's a lot of potential. And so what you can see in this plot are the sale of drugs, orphan drugs is in the dark blue and non-orphan drugs is in the light blue. And what you can see since 2001, the amount of interest in getting orphan drugs for many diseases has accelerated dramatically in the pharmaceutical industry. And so what, what we really need is to get big pharma, the Merck's, the Pfizer's, the GSK, um, Bristol-Myers Squibb, et al., really interested in this area so that they can advance therapies. And again, um, because there's many unifying themes that are going on in, in the myotonic dystrophies and other disorders, it makes it much easier for these guys there, uh, to figure out the lessons that they're learning in these diseases and applying it to a whole host of other diseases, which, which is going to make it um, more profitable for them in the end. And that's their companies, right? So that's why they're interested in it. If you can go to the next slide. And the other advantage in orphan drug development are twofold. And so can you go up, up one slide to slide 35? Oh, um, oh back. can you go up? Go to 35. Yeah, so if you want to look at the orphan drug disease area, here's, here's this link to a Thomas Reuters products um, summary of this area that I put online. Um, it's, it's pretty pretty optimistic for development in this general area of therapeutics. So can you go to the next slide? And so the other advantage is there's lots of incentives that not only the federal government, but in terms of diseases, are, are in, have been put into making therapeutics for orphan diseases, right? So for example, there are research and development or R&D drivers, which can be uh, tax credits, grants to do research and development of getting these drugs. Uh, the federal government has waived certain uh, Food and Drug Administration fees. They've shortened the development timelines. And there can also be a greater regulatory success. And so the greater, greater success of getting these compounds in the clinic has to do with the genetic basis of disease. And so that can be thought of as if you want to make a drug for disease, you really need to identify a patient population that's affected by the disease. And the beauty of modern day genetics is that because we can sequence someone's genome, you can very quickly identify patients that are afflicted by the disease and, I, and, and know that um, if you give them a treatment, you can get uh, useful information from uh, the study. There's also commercial drivers for this. Um, and one of the major ones is there's, there's much fewer hurdles to getting drugs approved for orphan diseases, which actually accelerates the approval pipeline that I articulated in slide 33 or so. If we can go to the next slide. And so I want to sort of end this. So, so I think it's, it's uh, I'm optimistic about advances in this area, um, and I'm, I, I'm really excited about science. I'm really excited about, um, I stay up at night dreaming about ways to, to take my ideas and uh, use it to advance therapy in this, in this, this area. 
And so, you know, I think there are some things that maybe we need that are being developed. And so one thing we really need is high quality animal models that recapitulate aspects of the disease, like mouse models, for example. And so some of the advancements that's happened in myotonic dystrophy type 1, in my opinion, has occurred in part because we have animal models that recapitulate aspects of the disease, and therefore you can do drug development studies to figure out if your drug can repair uh, a myotonic dystrophy defect in an animal and use that data to inform a study on patient population. Animals can also be very powerful tools to study and figure out potential ways to treat diseases and they can identify new drug targets. So surprisingly, when you go to the supermarket past the fruit, the fruit stand, right, there's a bunch of fruit flies. And so they're a nuisance, right, generally, but actually fruit flies are very important model organisms that people use all the time to study neuromuscular disorders like DM1 and DM2. And so the advantage of these model organisms is you can figure out you know, new ways to drug this RNA to have a therapeutic. And so I think uh, research in this area is really advancing, especially for DM2. And so Laura Ranum's group at the University of Florida is making great progress on making DM2 mouse models. And uh, that's going to really accelerate things even further. So if we can go to the next slide. So I'm going to wrap up here and thank uh, my group of people that did in that did the work and the taxpayers and people that contributed to Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation and Muscular Dystrophy Association that funded the work. And so I really um, have been blessed to work with a bunch of very talented uh, collaborators and coworkers in the area of Myotonic Dystrophy Type 2. Um, so Partha Sarkar and George Schatz have been very helpful in not only helping us, Partha in particular has been very helpful in figuring out how to get a cell assay uh, up and running where we could monitor the effect of drugs on DM2 defects. Uh, George Schatz and Ilya Sildirum have worked to help us solve the structure of small molecules bound to DM2 repeats. Uh, Jessica, Tuan, Suzanne, Lee Ray, Hai Jung, Alex, and Melissa have all worked in my lab on various aspects of DM2. And, um, and we also want to thank the NIH for funding us and Muscular Dystrophy Association. And so thank you for this, this opportunity. Don't, don't leave yet. We have Dr. Day who's going to join us. Hello, Dr. Day. Yes, hi. Do you hear me? We can hear you. And, hi, John. and uh, Dr. Yeah, Day, I'm is you're still there? I'm here. Okay, great. So now we have uh, both of you in the room, and I wanted to ask you a few questions. Um, well, people want to know when clinical trials on humans will begin, and I know you had that chart up there on one of your slides. Do you both want to address that? Yeah, do you, do you want to? John, you'd be you'd be more educated to to comment on that, but I think it's it's a ways away. I think for DM two, we need we need better animal models, and then see where it goes from there. Yeah, I think, um, you know, that the speed of, of development has really increased along the lines that Matt was talking about for the orphan drug development, so that it really it's possible to get drugs uh, from kind of first uh, clin clinical or laboratory indication, rather, first laboratory indication of, of it working to clinical trials within five to ten years. And that sounds like a long time. And it is, but it's actually much shorter than it used to be, because I think things are going faster. So we can, you know, if I, it kind of depends on where Matt's group is in in identifying uh, potential compounds. But once they think they have a target compound, yeah, you know, we could hope that we could be in at least an early phase clinical trials within years or so. There is a question. Uh uh, from the audience, if the drug works, what happens to the individual? Will the muscles grow back or will the muscles stop deteriorating? And again, I don't think we're going to know until uh, we're, we're there and able to try it. Um, you know, we certainly hope that, that Laura's group and other groups that are working on DM2 mouse models have uh, animals that we can do these testings, tests on. Uh, very soon. Uh, 
but there's also the potential that that if we if it's a compound that looks like it's not very toxic, uh, that that there is at least a precedent for going from cellular studies in the lab to uh, clinical trials. So that's not going to necessarily hold us up if we have something that looks like it's effective. But to prove that it works, it's very helpful to have the animal model before you go into clinical trials. Here's a, uh, there are a couple of questions about um, exercises and proper nutrition for DM2 and uh, another question, are there any dietary supplements that you'd recommend to counteract the ill effects of DM2? So in terms of exercise, I think, you know, there's strong agreement that um, exercise um, is beneficial, um, but exactly uh, prescribed exercise uh, regimen is hard to define and has to be tailored to the individual. So we typically will rec recommend um, you know, maintained aerobic exercise and stretching and balance exercise uh, with caution in this um, strengthening exercises because some forms of strengthening exercise can actually uh, damage muscles. So that has to be done with more care, uh, but maintaining uh, flexibility and balance and stamina are all uh, definitely strongly recommended and I think we can see that in in uh, some individuals uh, whose lifestyle has allowed them to do quite well with DM2. Um, the nutritional side of things is a little less clear uh, but again there's a fairly good recommendation of just maintaining a healthy diet and uh, trying hard to prevent any uh, extra body weight. Uh, that certainly isn't going to be helpful for uh, people who have, who have weak muscles. And in terms of some of the effects of myotonic dystrophy, uh, there are at least individuals who will tell me that they do better uh, with low carbohydrate diets rather than uh, having high carbohydrate diets. But that's not proven. Is there anything that we, for example, non-doctors, non-pharma people can do to help accelerate the development approval process? you have any ideas on that, Matt? Um, yeah, I, I think the FDA and other organizations have tried to make it as streamlined as they can with uh, the goal of never, you know, trying to do more harm than good. So I think there are already, um, there's already uh, a safety net implicit in how they've been moving things forward for these these orphan diseases. So I, um, I, I would say uh, vote for. <laughs> I'm going to sound too much like a like a science <laughs> nerd, but I would say vote for. Uh, your representatives that advocate for science because funding at NIH uh, really has a large impact on people like uh, John and I and doing basic research and trying to to really get our ideas developed to the point where they can they can help a patient and so that you know NIH funding really does play a large role in our ability uh, to operate and and really uh, try to accomplish uh, goals in these areas. Um, the other thing to do is be an advocate for your disease, right? Uh, so I think really getting active in the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation and, and raising money. So a lot of the, the work that I just described uh, was done basically by a, a postdoc who was funded by MDF. And so even a little bit of money, uh, 50 grand or so, can have have a have a big impact and so I think any way that you can get involved in advocating for your a disease area or diseases in general I think I think are are highly impactful um, yeah that's that's a good point um, MDF is getting very involved in advocacy efforts and the theme of this year's conference in Washington DC is advocacy so people can learn more uh, we have a webinar on the website, uh, sort of the beginning of the advocacy training. We have a, another question here. How would a person go about signing up to be a volunteer in testing? <laughs> 
Well, I think that the, the registries are, are clearly the way to go. Uh, yeah, so I would hope that everyone is uh, signed up on the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation registry. Uh, that gives the investigators uh, an immediate access to uh, the, the uh, Myotonic Dystrophy population. Uh, the uh, University of Rochester National Myotonic Dystrophy Registry also is uh, very important in terms of um, providing additional information about patients so that we can uh, identify the correct population for any particular studies. Uh, but those are the key key sides. And then, um, you know, there are uh, some medical centers that are more focused on myotonic dystrophy research uh, than others, and if you happen to uh, live near them or able to, or, or are able to travel to them, uh, that provides another way of making sure that you're connected. One of the important things uh, that uh, patients can do uh, to uh, facilitate research is to make sure that they're connected so that when we do these studies, we can get them done rapidly. Um, and with the uh, best patient population to answer the questions at hand. Yeah, well, yes, I think that's, that's pretty important because, you know, there's not a ton of patients that are affected by the disease. And so in order to do clinical trial, there, there has to be a mobilization of patient populations with places that are going to ultimately do clinical trials. So you need to let them know who you are. So one final question, are people with DM2 able to build new muscles such as after breaking a leg or working out? Yes, I mean it certainly is possible to uh, regain some function if you've been incapacitated for a period of time. But it's also true that as the disease progresses, the muscle um, it becomes replaced by uh, scar tissue. And when that occurs, uh, it's not possible to just, through rehabilitation methods, increase the function of that muscle. So the goal is certainly to keep the muscle as healthy as possible uh, uh, and to avoid uh, that deterioration. Uh, but that's what we're trying to develop new treatments that are going to further uh, control the disease. Do either of you have any other comments? Um, we're, we're near the end. I would, I'd like to uh, say one thing about Matt's talk. I think it's really incredibly important. I think a, a lot of focus has been put on the antisense oligonucleotide approach, and I think we're all excited about that approach and are looking forward to seeing what it does, first in myotonic dystrophy type 1, but possibly in the future for myotonic dystrophy type 2. But in all likelihood, that's not going to be curative. It, it I hope, you know, does a lot to control the disease. But I think we have to focus on developing all, all ways we can to control um, the effects of the genetic change in myotonic dystrophy. And I think it's very exciting, uh, the research that Matt's doing, uh, to come up with alternative approaches that are really going to uh, possibly work alongside or, or with uh, the antisense approach to completely control the disease. Dr. Disney, did you have any final comments? Um, no, I'm good. So yeah, <laughs> okay. thank, thank you. Well, I want to thank you both Thanks, so Jeff. much. Thank you, Dr. Day, for for participating and and helping you know answer some of these more. Uh, clinical questions and uh, and Dr. Disney, it was a great presentation. I, I feel like you took me on a ride, and I and I got it. All the metaphors and everything really helped um, me understand, you know, a, a lot of things I haven't understood for a while. So thank you both very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we are. Winding down, but I'd like you to just hold on for a couple of moments. I want to make sure you all know about our warm line feature. You can access the warm line form at this um, web address. It's on the MDF website. And you will receive a, uh, a link to a brief survey.
about this experience. Uh, you can we really look forward to getting your feedback about the webinar and future webinars. So please respond to the email in your inbox. And I think that's it. Thank you for your participation. Thank you.